people got a lucky, don't they, Mom? Why do you say that? Well, they don't have to be smart. They don't have to get jobs or anything. All they got to do is get married. <laughs> well, Beaver, being smart isn't exactly a drawback to marriage. Well, if they don't get married, well, they can become dressmakers or cut people's nails in a barber shop. Or take care of kids and a lot of other dumb stuff. <laughs> well, Beaver, today girls can be doctors and lawyers, too, you know. They're just as ambitious as boys are. You mean there's no dumb people left in the world, Mom? <laughs> Beaver, is there something bothering you? Well, kind of, Mom. We're having an intelligence test tomorrow in school, and I don't know if I'm going to pass it. Oh, Beaver. Beaver, of course you will. Your father did very well in school, and I got good grades. You had a grandfather that was a professor. Why, he was considered practically a genius. Yeah, it's nice having all that smart stuff in the family, Mom. I just hope it didn't all get worn out before it came to me. <laughs> Hi, this is Bruce Boxleitner, and you're listening to Then Is Now podcast. Rise and shine, my sinners, when Father Evil starts his day. He gets a little deadly. Deadly Grounds Coffee has the richest, smoothest flavor you'll find anywhere. It's sinfully delicious. Once you go deadly, you never go back. Order yours at getdeadly.com. Coffee's so good, it's scary. A sick school is this? Uh oh, don't go! The plan, the plan. Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. You're going to need a bigger boat. Surely you can't be serious. I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. You got spunk. <laughs> I hate spunk. Danger, Will Robinson. Danger. Oh, righty. How are you doing? Back off, man. I'm a scientist. Don't make me angry. You wouldn't like me when I'm angry. Say hello to my little friend. Ah! I love the smell of rape come in the morning. What are you people? On dope? Stop whining. I got a crap on your deck that you choke a donkey. Who is your daddy? I'm sorry, but all questions must be submitted in writing. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. Can I do that? I'll be back. A dino man! Show me the money! Don't! Up your nose, will you never hold? What? I'm sailing! I'm sailing! Groovy. You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it. Pull it down. Nothing's never happened to say you're sorry. Here's looking at you, kid. We got no food. We got no jobs. Our pets' heads are falling off! Come to the coast. We get together. Have a few laughs. Hear that, Elizabeth? <laughs> I'm coming to join you, honey. I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. I love it when a plan comes together. What we do is if we need that extra push over the cliff, you know what we do? Put it up to 11. 11, exactly. One louder. Why don't you just make 10 louder and make 10 be the top number and make that a little louder? These go to 11. We're on a mission from God. Hello and welcome to another fabulous episode of Then Is Now Podcast. I am your host, Rigor. Now, there are things in our pop culture that older people have grown up with and it became part of our lives. The goal of this show is to keep those things alive for the next generation to appreciate. While it was fraught with its share of negative aspects, the 1950s have always been held up as the symbol of what an idyllic America should be. One of the best representatives of the American family in the 1950s was the Cleaver household, as portrayed on the iconic and classic television series Leave it to Beaver. The Cleavers exemplified the idealized suburban family of the mid-20th century. The show, which ran from 1957 to 1963, was about an inquisitive and often naive boy, Theodore Beaver Cleaver, and his adventures at home, school, and around his suburban neighborhood. The show also starred Barbara Billingsley and Hugh Beaumont as Beaver's parents, June and Ward Cleaver, respectively, and Tony Dow as Beaver's brother, Wally. The series was produced by Joe Connolly and Bob Mosher, who you may remember as the producers of The Munsters as well. 
On today's episode, we have the iconic star of Leave it to Beaver, and we are going to take a dive into his fascinating and fun life. If you haven't seen Leave it to Beaver or know a young person who hasn't, you really ought to because the show presents quite a few tough lessons for kids to learn, and it's just simply good, wholesome family entertainment, the kind we rarely get anymore. So please sit back and enjoy a great interview with an iconic child star. Class is in session. I have a bad feeling about this. How could I possibly be expected to handle school on a day like this? Food fight! Hey, you in my class? Oh, yeah, I am today. I think you should consider transferring to shop class. Whoa, whoa! Now, now, very few students are severely injured in shop class. Bueller. When you were in school. Bueller. Did you ever cut class? Bueller. Yeah, I guess I did. Sure, most kids cut classes. Good. Sign this. Um, he's sick. I get so lonely when I hear that third attendance bell oh, ring and all my kids are not here. Seven years of college down the drain. Fat, drunk, and stupid is no way to go through life, son. You lack discipline. As long as I'm here, there will be no grades or gold stars or demerits. We're going to have recess all the time. Woo! Go! Play and have fun now! Okay, folks, I know I often preface interviews with this, but you really are truly in for a great treat today. Joining me on the show is a man who started off as a child actor in the 1950s, showing up in such things as Stuart Heisler's This Is My Love, Studio 57, The Deep Six, The Shadow on the Window, and Alfred Hitchcock's The Trouble with Harry, just to name a few. But it was his role as Theodore Beaver Cleaver on the iconic sitcom Leave It to Beaver that catapulted him into our pop culture and would forever endear countless generations to his naive and relatable young character. The show ran for six full 39-week seasons and was placed on Time Magazine's unranked 2007 list of all-time 100 TV shows and is still in syndication today. He later appeared on the Batman TV series, My Three Sons, Lassie, Flying High, The Love Boat, Parker Lewis Can't Lose, as well as the TV movies The Girl, The Gold Watch, and Dynamite, High School USA, and the film Back to the Beach, as well as Still the Beaver, which led to the production of the new Leave it to Beaver series in 1983. He's worked with such a amazing talent as Ed Wynn, Linda Darnell, John Forsyth, Shirley MacLaine, Alan Ladd, Bob Hope, Ronald Reagan, and so many others. Now, not only was he one of the first American actors to star in a professional British panto performed in the United States where he played Baron Hardup in the theatrical debut of Cinderella, but he also made his Broadway debut with a starring role as Wilbur Turnblad in the Tony-winning Best Musical Hairspray at the Neil Simon Theater playing to a standing-room-only houses with attendance at 110 10%. His other theater credits include Boeing Boeing, Who's On First, and the national debut tour of So Long Stanley, which also played to standing room only houses across the country for 18 months. In the mid-1990s, he was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes and has been a spokesperson for many diabetes-related issues to encourage people and help them to manage their type 2 diabetes. He's also an often requested speaker for national conventions and trade shows where he talks about the topics of taking control of diabetes with diet and exercise and the state of of the American family. He continues to do commercial work for national and regional spots as well and has a high Q rating, which means his name and face are recognized all around the world. And he was also named by People Magazine as one of the most well-known individuals in television history. In 1998, he published a book called And Jerry Mathers as the Beaver, in which he discussed his career, life after the show, and many other personal issues he struggled with. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my privilege and honor to introduce a man who remains one of my childhood idols, Mr. Jerry Mathers. Hi there. How you doing? Boy, that was a great introduction. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for joining me today. I'm just so thrilled to have you here. That's my pleasure. Awesome, awesome. So now, usually I try to um, to not ask a guest questions they've been asked a thousand times, but I have so many questions, so I want to apologize in advance if some of my re questions seem sort of redundant or you're tired of answering them. <laughs> no problem. I usually don't get tired. I just make up lies. Oh, there you go. <laughs> awesome. So usually the first thing I'll ask first-time guests is, you know, how did you get to, onto the pact of acting? Now, the, the first thing you did was the pet condensed milk commercial with Ed Wynn on the Colgate Comedy Hour, and you were two, right? Yes, but I, I started actually. My mom was going through a department store looking for a, a little outfit for me for my second birthday, and a lady came up to her and said, is that your son? And I guess I was a little ways away from her, and my mom went, oh, wait a minute, whatever he touched or broke, I'll pay for <laughs> And the lady said, no, but I've noticed you've been trying on a few outfits, and he seems to fit our clothes 
perfectly, would you be interested in him being a model in a fashion show? And my mom kind of went, oh, this is a big city. Yes, maybe. What's going on here? She said, well, I don't know. And the lady said, well, you know, if he would do this, all he'd have to do would be hold a model's hand, walk out, and she'll ask him to turn around, and then walk off the stage with her, and we would pay him, and he could keep the outfit that he, that he wore. And my mom said he could do that. <laughs> That's awesome. And where was this? That was a uh, department store at the time called Desmond's. I don't even know if they're still around anymore. But um, And from that, that people don't realize it. Uh, I didn't even realize it. Television was just kind of starting back then. That was about 1950. And so there weren't a lot of child actors that did live TV, especially here in Los Angeles. In New York, they could go to the New York stage. But in Los Angeles, everybody worked in films. So they looked around and they saw that the models um, at the department stores were used to working in front of a live audience, and most of the live shows then had a live audience. So they didn't want a kid that might walk out there for a live show and <laughs> suddenly see an audience to see all the cameras and panic. And so I started on live TV at 2. Uh, Alfred Hitchcock came on to one of them. That, this was in about, was about 5, I think. And he wow. saw he was doing a show that was Shirley MacLaine and John Forsythe's first movie. It was not mine. And he took me back to Stowe, Vermont. And he became a good friend of mine. Even when I was doing Leave it to Beaver, he was doing Alfred Hitchcock Presents. So it was a lot of fun, and he was a very nice man. And I just had a great time as an actor. That's amazing. That's amazing. And, you know, so what kind of a person was he like? He was just really nice. I mean, I, uh, you know, a lot of people say that he was hard to work with and stuff, but being a child, you know, he would study my lines with me and he'd say, no, change it just a little bit this way or that way, and I would do it. So uh, uh, when I saw him when I was older, I mean, I wasn't that much older. I was probably maybe eight or nine. He'd always wave, and I'd see him drive by in his, like, chauffeur-driven limousine or in the in the commissary when we, uh, you know, went to lunch, he'd always come over and just say hi and just a really nice man as far as I was concerned. That's incredible. That's so amazing. And it goes to show, like, why his films were so good because he would take the time to do something like that with you, you know? Well, that's true. I, I you know, just found him to be a, a, a wonderful person to work with. And plus, when you're, you know, when you're working at a studio, it's a little different. But when you go on location like that in Stowe, Vermont, you know, we'd go to the... the they did, all the ladies of the town would try, because he was a gourmet, Hitchcock was a, a, a gourmet, and they'd all try to see which, you know, they'd lay out all their food, and there'd probably be 10 or 20 women sometimes, and the ones he would pick, I'd walk right behind him and pick the same ones, because he always got the best food. <laughs> That's awesome. That is so cool. Oh, man. So, now, quite a few child stars uh, couldn't really handle the fame and or money. They ended up often going down dark, sometimes tragic paths. How did you handle being a, a child star? Because you led a relatively great life after Leave it to Beaver. Uh, not even relatively, a great life. Um, I think probably it was my family. My dad was really good with working with kids because he was a teacher and then a counselor and a head counselor and later on a superintendent of L.A. City Schools. So, he really knew kids and, you know, what you could get away with and when you were heading down the wrong path. And, you know, it was just an accident. My parents, a lot of the people that were child actors, their parents weren't working and, you know, they were the, the person that, you know, was the household. If they didn't work, the family didn't eat. My dad was fully employed and, you know, working. Um, I just happened to be, you know, picked when my mom was doing a, uh, at a, at a a big department store, a lady said, you know, could he model these? My mom said, yes. Next thing I was doing live TV because in New York they could go to the Broadway stage. Kids out here, the only people they had that worked in front of a live audience were the models. Right, right. And around that time, did you get a chance to meet or hang out with any of your peers, like, you know, Keith Dibodeau, who was Little Ricky, or, or Jay North, and, or Johnny Crawford, any of those guys? You know, I would see them very rarely because we were all at different studios. So if, you know, somebody that was at Universal, I, I might see, but even then, you know, you're you're working. You're doing an eight-hour day, but you get an hour for lunch. You're going to school for three hours. So when you're not in school or at lunch, they try to do all your scenes and your close-ups. I always felt bad for the adults because then they have to go back after we would leave at either 8 to 5 or 9 to 6, and then they'd have to relight the whole set to their close-ups. So they might be there till 
you know, sometimes, you know, 8 or 9 o'clock at night when we either worked 8 to 5 or 9 to 6. And even if they were in the middle of a scene at, at that time, when that number came up, that teacher would walk right in and say, I'm sorry, you know, you can't work him any longer, and we'd walk off the set. Right, right. And was that because of the Coogan Law, or was the Coogan Law to deal with money? Um, you know, I'm not that familiar with the Coogan Law, exactly what it was, but those were just, the, that was the the law at that time. Um, you know, there were just certain hours because we weren't adults. As soon as you turned 18, then you could work, you know, the full time. Um, and they could get, if there was, there was a few times on Leave it to Beaver when they got special permission, but... Um, because they needed a night scene or something like that. But for the most part, and then we wouldn't come in until like noon, and they could keep you a couple of hours later just so they could get a scene that authentically looked like night with the stars and stuff. Oh, okay. Okay, that makes sense. And you did an episode of Lassie. Do you have any recollection of doing that and working with John Provost and June Lockhart? Yeah, it was a lot of fun. You know, it was always fun going to a, a new studio and, you know, meeting the people, and I knew the the weather waxers, and they were the people that that owned Lassie, the the actual owners of the dogs. And there were not just one Lassie. I think usually they had three or four on stage. Now they looked exactly like I couldn't tell the difference, but you know, one was the sitting Lassie, one did this, one was the one that would go <laughs> chase people and whatever. But uh, it was just a lot of fun going to a new studio and meeting a lot of new people, and you know, kind of exploring. It was always fun for me. That's awesome. That's so cool. And how were they to work with, you know, June Lockhart and John? Well, you know, probably they were the ones that had to worry about working because kids are, you know, an adult actor. You can say, I'm going to sue you if you don't do this or that. But <laughs> kids, you know, uh, I, I never had this problem. But, you know, I was having so much fun there. I loved going to the studio. And, you know, people would talk to you and you'd go to lunch uh, a lot of times. And they were just everybody was very, very nice. And so it was an ideal situation. That's great. That's so cool. And how old were you when you did Beaver? You were nine, right? Um, actually, I was about almost eight when I did the pilot, and then it took them a while to sell it. And I actually went on the original interview when I was, uh, you know, I think seven and a half. Wow. Around there. It's a long time ago, and I don't, honestly, I don't really remember. And then we shot for six years, and so we had 234 episodes by the time it was over. And then in the 80s, we did the new Leave it to Beaver for another six years. Right, right. And so how did the part uh, come about for you? Did you basically just audition and got the part? or? Well, I basically auditioned, but they had about almost uh, 800 kids on the audition. Now, at the time, wow. it was a little confusing, and I say that because they were looking, and they, you don't know this when you go on an audition, but we walk in, and there were kids all the way from older than six, because six is when you can work more hours, right? To, you know, like twenty three and twenty four, but they and we were just kind of wondering because some of these, you know, how why would I be on the same interview with that person? But it's because they were looking for all the characters. They're not only looking for Beaver, they were looking for Wally, Eddie, Lumpy, all these different characters that they had already written, and they were looking for people to fit those those you know, what they had in mind for those characters. Right, okay, that makes sense, yeah. And one thing I liked about the show is it was done differently than other shows about suburban families like uh, like Ozzy and Harriet or Father Knows Best because it focused on the kids instead of the adults. So this being a starring role for you at such a young age, did, did your life cha change at that time as a result, or were you even aware, uh, you know, of the fact that you were the star of a major TV show? Um, you know, I don't think I was aware of it. I had done a lot of movies. I'd done a lot of live TV. You know, I'd worked with people like I was in Shirley MacLaine and one of John Forsythe's first movies, and I'd done several before that. So, I mean, I was working with these acclaimed actors, and, you know, so Leave it to Beaver was just really easy. I mean, when you're doing a movie, it's a lot more work because you're doing them for, you know, uh, a, a lot longer. And, you know, I walked in, and I read the part, and the thing that really got me the job is I just joined the Cub Scouts, and I was getting ready, I think it was my first, maybe my second meeting, and my mom said, oh, we've got, you know, a call back on that interview you went on the other day, and I said, Mom, I can't go, and she said, what do you mean you can't go? I said, well, I've got my meeting today, and she <laughs> said, well, it's, you know, it's, in the, it's right after school, and your meeting's not till like two hours or so, but I'm the kind of person that uh, always likes to be on time, so I got in there, and I'd been on this interview for many weeks where they and I didn't realize that they'd already kind of they were going towards me and they were trying to pick brothers and you know friends of mine 
but there were also a couple other kids that they were also doing the same thing with. And so I said, okay, and I went in there, and I was pretty antsy. And they said, what's the matter? And I said, well, I, I really have to go. And they said, what do you mean you have to go? <laughs> I said, well, I've got a Cub Scout meeting, and if I don't leave really quickly, I'm going to be late. So they said, all right, you can go. And my mom, when I came out, said, what happened, Jerry? And I said, oh, they asked me if I wanted to be here, and I told them no, so they said I could go. And my mom went, We've been on this interview for weeks. <laughs> oh, you don't want to do it? And I said, no, I just said I had to go to a meeting. And they called that night and said I had the job. They'd rather have a kid that wanted to be a Cub Scout than an actor. <laughs> That's crazy. Oh, man, how was schooling done while you were working? Well, schooling was very, very easy and probably the best education you can ever imagine. My dad at the time was a principal and then a superintendent of L.A. City Schools, but they had private tutors, and they would pick the best teacher for your grade. It pays a lot more than a, a regular teacher's pay because they're also welfare workers. So any time you're on the set, they have to be there, and they make sure that you go to lunch at the right time, they don't work you overtime, that nothing's dangerous. And Tony had, because he was in high school most of the time, he had one teacher and I had another. So I had a, you know, like the, it's the kings and queens of Europe's education, a private tutor, the best one that they could find for my grade level, and one-on-one -on -one with everything. So if you're behind in any subject, they can do it a lot more until you come up to grade level. And if you're ahead, they say, okay, well, you've done enough of that today. But we're going to go back to this subject you're having problems with. Nice. That's awesome. And it's just funny, you know, watching Beaver growing up, and it was one of those shows, and I, I think this is one of the strengths of the show, one of the many strengths of the show is that, you know, I, I as an audience member could, and a young kid could either identify with Beaver and what he had been doing, or I would learn from his mistakes, you know, and I, I just thought that was, it, it's such a great show, it's, it's just wholesome family entertainment, you know? And I think the really, the key thing was it, is that it, it was all from real life. Those things, the, the producers had, I think it was 12 or 13 kids between them, Conley and Mosier. So they were taking things that their kids said or did or that other parents told them their, you know, the, they'd sit around with the parents at the whatever nights and talk to them, and they'd say, my kid did this. And the next, probably two weeks later, the beaver was doing that. So all those stories are from real life, and they're not just things that people were writing and making up jokes and trying to do a, a you know, a situation comedy. Wow, that's incredible. I was going to ask you about that, actually. And did you keep in contact with uh, Joe and Bob after the show? Well, you know, I did, but not, you know, I was a child, so it wasn't like I would see them at many events or anything because, because they were producers. You know, when we, even when we'd go to, you know, whatever it was, for the most part, they weren't there. They were very nice to me. I'm not saying I had any problems with them. But it was just that they were adults, and I was a kid. Right, right. That makes sense. Did you ever get a chance to get on the set of their show, The Munsters? Yes. I, uh, I, you know, in fact, they were filming down the street, and I'd go down there. And our makeup man, uh, his name was Bob Don, was one of the top makeup men in the business. And the reason we got him is because ours was a show that all, everybody wanted to work in. Because if you have kids, they can only work 8 to 5 or 9 to 6. They do a few more after six or five with the adults, and then they went home. Some of the other shows would film, you know, late into the night if you had adult actors because it's easier to, they, they had to pay them overtime if they went over, you know, over after five or six. So it was just a, a great way to grow up, and I had a lot of friends on the set, uh, like the, the grips and the people would help me, and I used to build wooden boats, and they'd take it down to the, <laughs> the, uh, the different places they had there with the huge saws and, helped me make all these things. So, you know, it was like having a whole big family of all these wonderful people that were my very good friends, and it was just a lot of fun working on the show. That is so cool. That's so amazing. And now I'm not going to ask you specifics about particular episodes, but I'm going to, I did want to mention that my favorite uh, Leave it to Beaver episode to this day is the one called Sweatshirt Monsters, where um, you and your friends bought these monster sweatshirts and you all agreed to wear them to school. And then, of course, Beaver's the only one who does it and he, you know, violates the school dress code and stuff. And I, you know, to this day, I want one of those sweatshirts. <laughs> well, you could probably make your own because those are just something that the, uh, the wardrobe man just made. He actually painted them by hand. Wow. Um, and there was only one of each one because I think probably Larry and Gil, I forget how many he actually had, but he just painted these monsters on them with the help of the makeup man whose name was Bob Don, who was a very 
famous makeup man because he did also a lot of the things for the movies and stuff. So it was a lot of fun doing that show, but every episode had something that was, you know, interesting and different. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I wanted to talk about the cast for a little bit here. Um, now, Hugh Beaumont is one of my favorites. I just love it when he pops up in the old sci- 50s sci-fi films. And, you know, and I have to say, when my kids were born, Ward Cleaver was my go-to role model that I would think of when I was trying to parent them, you know, and try to do things like the Cleavers, like they would have to ask to be excused at the dinner table, that sort of thing, you know, and it's just in the show, he comes across as a genuine nice guy, and how was he to work with in real life? A really nice guy, and interestingly enough, he was a Methodist minister, and before Leave it to Beaver, he was down in the worst part of L.A. and got jobs as an actor just so he could support this church in L.A. that couldn't afford a preacher. And then when he, of course, did leave it to Beaver, he was there five days a week. But uh, he was really a a minister. And I think when he took Beaver, when I'd done something into the den to talk to me, that being a minister really came through. But just the, the nicest guy you could ever imagine. That's great. That's great. You know, one of the episodes that I really loved was where he's explaining to Beaver that he was in the Seabees. And I, if I remember correctly, you know, Beaver thought he fought, you know, killed bad guys in the war. But he was with the construction battalion instead, and he sort of makes his case. And I just remember as a kid being suitably impressed by that. And I, I actually almost couldn't understand why Beaver was unhappy the fact, with the fact that he didn't kill anybody, you know? <laughs> well, you know how boys are. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. And, of course, Barbara Billingsley was played your mom, June Cleaver. And, you know, I just, I had been watching Leave it to Beaver before the movie Airplane came out. And when that came out, my mother took me to see it. I was like, oh, my God, it's it's June Cleaver. And she was so hilarious in that. And it was just, at least in my mind, it was a testament to her abilities as an actress because she just jumped into the silly role. And it was wonderful. And did that sort of sort of bring her back into the public eye? Well, it definitely did, because people were just so shocked that she could do that when they saw her as, you know, June Cleaver with her, you know, her apron and (laughs) waving goodbye to the boys. And then saw that, they went, you know, she's a really great actress. She can just, you know, play all these different roles. Right. (laughs) And she even talked jive talk. Right. Yes. So funny. It was it was just so wonderful to see that. And, of course, you know, Tony Dow, which you're still friends with Tony, right? Oh, very much so. Uh, You know, growing up, he was not really my, I'm the oldest in my family and kind of, you know, peculiarly, he's the youngest in his. He has an older brother, but I have a sister and three other brothers. So, but he was just an incredible person because he was an Olympic, he was training actually for the Olympics when he came for the job for Leave it to Beaver. And he was an athlete. He could take four or five steps, jump up the air, do a front flip and land on his feet. He could go off a high board at the beach uh, or in the pool. And so I just watched him, and I knew I couldn't do that, and I thought a lot of kids could. But uh, he was, you know, just a really nice person. I do see him a lot. We do autograph shows and things like that together. So, you know, he's still a good friend and uh, still as athletic as ever. That's awesome. That's so cool. And, you know, he's another one that I love when he would show up in things like in, you know, Quincy or, Quincy or Diagnosis Murder. Or, but he became a prominent director, too. He did some of my favorite shows like Babylon 5 and Swamp Thing and uh, one of the Star Treks. I think it was Deep Space Nine. Yeah, he's, he's a very good person uh, for being a director. And, you know, I think he learned a lot of things from the directors we had on Leave it to Beaver. We had uh, Norman Abbott and, uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of great people on Leave it to Beaver who were feature film directors. So, you know, we'd sit there and not watch them, but we were watching them to see, you know, um, what they were doing. He's also a a very good sculptor, and he does a lot of artwork, too, so he's very creative. Oh, that's awesome. That's awesome. And did you ever stay in touch after the show with some of the the kids that played your friends, like, you know, Rusty Stevens and Stanley Fafara and Rich Carell, all those guys? Carell was always a good friend of mine, and uh, I used to go over to his house, and he'd come over to mine. But, you know, a lot of them lived in very, I guess you'd say, far away from us since I couldn't drive. You know, it it was more of something when they came on the set, I was always happy to work with them. But, uh, no, it wasn't like I could just go down the street or even go to school. I went to school on the set with them, but then they went to other schools that I was in. Right, right, okay. And Stephen Talbot, who played Gilbert, he's still working, and he's still going strong on TV shows and movies. Yeah, he was a really good actor, and, you know, his his father was Lyle Talbot, who was a, a great actor, too, that you see in a lot of different shows. Oh, okay. And he, I think, does a lot of PBS and things like that. 
but he was just a very nice guy. And as I say, I was always happy when I read the script that he or Richard or, you know, Whitey, because if they weren't in that particular show, they didn't come in that week. They weren't working every week with me. Right. So, you know, that, that, and then I'd have a lot more people, and the producers were nice enough to have a basketball court. We'd play basketball and stuff like that. And so I had some other companions that were my age. Right, right. And it's funny because um, Rusty's character, Larry Mandela, he's just one of those characters that always stuck in my head. In fact, my stepson has a friend that I refer to as Larry Mandela because he's he's just the same. You know, remember, Larry would always get Beaver to do something. Then Larry would chicken out and Beaver's the one left getting in trouble. And <laughs> there's so many kids in real life like that. Well, yeah, everybody has to have a friend like that until <laughs> you really figure them out. You get in a lot of trouble yourself. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And Richard Deacon, who played Fred Rutherford, he was just great. I mean, I loved him on, on the Dick Van Dyke show as Mel Cooley, you know? Yeah, he was a terrific actor. He was more, more so a stage actor, New York stage, and then he did dinner theater and came out here into Los Angeles and became, you know, a motion picture and, and film actor. But uh, they, everybody on the show, the, the producers were very, very, I guess, strict would be the world, but they wanted people that were family people and, you know, the set was very well run, and everybody got along very, very well. And if somebody was, you know, a little off key or whatever, they would uh, they wouldn't be back the next week. That's great. That's great. I wanted to ask about one particular actor who was one of my favorites on the show was uh, Burt Mustin, who played Gus the Fireman. You know, I, I remember seeing him on other things like The Brady Bunch and Sanford and Son, but to me, he was always Gus from Leave It to Beaver. I just loved the relationship, the the bond that you know uh, Beaver and Gus had. Well, you know what? You'll probably never saw him, though, as a young actor because he was um, in uh, real estate and didn't start acting until he was almost 65 years old. Wow. So people always say, you know, he's such a great actor. Where, what did, Was he in New York? Was he on the Broadway? What did he do before Leave it to Beaver and a lot of other shows? It just wasn't Leave it to Beaver. But uh, he just retired and didn't like to having to stay home all the time and I guess didn't have enough hobbies that his hobby was working on TV shows, and he did it very, very well. Right, right. And, of course, sadly, uh, last year we lost Ken Osmond, who played Eddie Haskell. And, you know, I I've read so many things that said in real life he was nothing like the character. And, you know, he's another one of those those characters, Eddie Haskell, was that, you know, we all grew up with someone that was sort of like him. But what was he like in real life? Well, he was the nicest person you'd ever want to meet, unless you were a criminal, because after he did Leave it to Beaver... He became a Los Angeles police officer. He's a motorcycle cop. That's right. So can you imagine you're speeding down the freeway or speeding up a <laughs> street? All of a sudden, the lights come on behind you, and this guy walks up, of course, in his big helmet and his glasses, and says, you were going a little fast, weren't you? And you look up, and there's Eddie Haskell. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I never even thought about it that way. That's hilarious. You know, one thing I loved in the show was in the later years, you kind of got to see Eddie's vulnerable side. He never really shared it with the other characters. But there were a few times, like I think there was one way his father was going to ship him off to Alaska or, or he was going to take a job in Alaska. And, you know, you got to really see his, not only the character, but also um, his acting chops. You know, he was, he was a very, very good actor. And, you know, in, in the... Uh, original, the first few seasons, everybody just really hated him, and they wanted to show him to be a little more vulnerable, and I think they did, and he was such a great actor, he took that role and just, you know, ate it up, and, uh, you know, even though he would be mean to be, he'd come back later on and say, well, I didn't really mean that, I was just, you know, I have to look tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. And so you had such great chemistry with all the cast. And did you, when you first started and you were younger and as you got older, were you able to sort of take things that you had done or learned and sort of roll them into the next episode, so to speak? You know, I don't really know if I can answer that or not. I really did learn a lot from everybody else. But, you know, it's just hard. When you're working like that with a crew, it's like your family. You learn things from your mother, your father, your brothers and your sisters, but you don't really realize it. You just know that, you know, like with Hugh Beaumont, he always came fully prepared, and so you didn't want to walk onto the set and not know your lines, and Barbara was the same way. So you didn't want to come, in, come on in and say, oh, I didn't study that part or I've forgotten that line, because they were just, you know, such great actors and actresses that, uh, you know, it was always, we could only be on the set as children from 8 to 5 or 9 to 6, so if you started messing up a lot of lines and lost them a lot of time, they would have to come back after and shoot their close-ups and all their different shots and might be there till late at night. So, 
you know, they always wanted you to be right on the button, and it was very easy because they were so good. That's great. That's great. And you, you always had to bring your A game with you, as as you just said, because you had to know, you know, you had to, you had limited time. And it, did that create any pressure at all? I don't think it was pressure. We just knew that, and, you know, we had two days of rehearsal. Monday we'd go in and read the script three or four times for the writers. And, uh, of course, for about the first, I think it was two or three years, I wouldn't read it, but I'd sit there and listen to it because, you know, I would slow them down, I guess, a little bit because they just gave me the script on Saturday night, and then you were supposed to study it and come in and read it. Tuesday we'd rehearse it on the set but without camera, and the next three days we'd shoot. So, you know, by the time you started shooting it, you really pretty much had your lines down and you knew what you had to do. So it really wasn't that hard, I don't think, for any of us. We were all accomplished actors, and it was just a lot of fun. Everybody was fun, Hugh Beaumont and Barbara Billingsley, even Eddie Haskell. I mean, he was just uh, Ken Osmond was a great guy. Ended up LAPD, so you know it was just a lot of fun to work with everybody, and I enjoyed going to work every day. Nice, that's so amazing. And was it a single camera shoot or multiple? Sing, single camera, but it was filmed on 35 millimeter film, just like a movie. Right. So you know, it was if you made a mistake, they would cut it. They'd either go back and start from the beginning, or they could, you know, if they were gonna had a place in it where they could cut to another character and then come back to that. But most of the time, if you made a mistake, they'd just say cut and start all over again. Then they'd go in for close-ups, two shots over their shoulders, all the different coverage is what they called it, so that they could have other things to go to if something happened or if they didn't like the look of it. But they had an establishing shot as a, as a long shot, and usually when they went out. Right, okay. Are you a lifelong fan of General Hospital? Are you a new fan who wants to know more about the history of the show? Do you enjoy talking about the show with others? Do you find yourself yelling at the TV? Is your self-care an hour a day in Port Charles? If so, we invite you to join hosts Amanda Kimmel and Shannon Coach at the place where all the hidden conversations take place and secrets are revealed. Meet us at Pier 54, a General Hospital fan podcast. Hello, this is Rod Barnett. I'm the host of The Bloody Pit the podcast that examines films from across the decades. On The Bloody Pit, we have several ongoing series of shows within the show focused on specific things in genre cinema that I and my co-hosts find fascinating. There's a long-running series focused on Italian maestro Antonio Margheriti's films from the 1960s all the way up through 1990. There's an on-again, off-again series focused on 1970s science fiction films. There's an in-depth look at the Western movies that William Castle made before he struck out on his own and became the horror auteur that we know and love. A look at the classic Coffin Joe films from Brazil. And our long-term project to look at every universal horror film made in the 1940s. That's a long project, people. It's going to take us a long time. Sprinkled in amongst those are various other episodes focused on other stranger areas of cinema, like uh, Lucio Fulci, Dario Argento, and even some obscure British crime films from time to time. So join me and my rotating crew of co-hosts as we examine the stranger side of cinema through an exploitation lens. Except when we don't. Yeah, you never really know exactly what to expect on The Bloody Pit. So join me for The Bloody Pit. Shark Bites, Shark Bite Podcast. It's the greatest show in history. From the Dorkening Network, hosted by a nerd who's named Patsy. From movie reviews to tips on surviving the coronavirus, Shark Bites has it all. Follow us on Facebook and suggest topics at sharkbitespod at gmail.com. Available on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, and wherever you get your favorite podcasts.
Now, there are a lot of actors like, um, for example, William Shatner or Anthony Geary. They, they sort of went through these periods after they played iconic characters where they kind of they felt the need, for whatever reason it was, to, to distance themselves from those characters. And then ultimately, they kind of came back and realized those characters were what made them popular. And, and they came to embrace the roles and the fans. Did you ever go through a period like that after Leave it to Beaver? Well, you know, in a way, yes, and in a way, you no. Know. I had started on Leave it to Beaver um, when I was in basically the first grade, and it went um, pretty much until I was ready to go to high school. So I had never been, I had a private tutor, and Tony had one because he was in basically high school. So um, I had never been in school with other kids, and I didn't get to play any sports, which were both very important to me. So when Leave it to Beaver ended, I went to a, and it was my freshman year in high school, I went to a regular high school as on the football team and the track team and had a wonderful time. So it wasn't that I really thought I missed anything, but it ended at a perfect time for me to go and then have a regular life for, you know, high school and college. Right, right. And I did work during the summers. I mean, it wasn't like I hated to work, but it was just so much more fun to be able to be on the football team. Right, exactly. And now I read an article, and I was curious if this was true or not. They ba- it basically said that you had, um, when you finally got to high school, there were some kids that were sort of, I, I don't know if that was necessarily bullying, but they weren't too nice to you because of Leave it to Beaver, and, you know, you you decided to go on to the football team to as a way of not really getting back to them, but just kind of getting them to back off of you. Is, is that true? Uh, it's true and not true. I was there and I was on the football team and a lot of the people, you know, that didn't really bother me, them coming up to me because as they say, they didn't really scare me, but a lot of my teammates didn't like the idea that they might be basically teasing me. And so I was just somebody that, you know, when a uh, maybe a 150-pound lineman comes up and says, he's our center. If you do this again, you're not going to be around here very long. <laughs> uh, people tended to kind of leave me alone. That's great. That's awesome. Um, it was funny. Recently, I caught you on an episode of Batman, and I, I had forgotten. I was like, oh, my God, it's Jerry Mathers, where you played the doorman named Pop, which is kind of funny because my son calls me Pop and my grandson calls me Pop. So um, what, what can you tell us about working on Batman? Well, it's just fun. You know, it wasn't a very long shoot. I was probably only there maybe a day or two. Um, and it was fun going to another set, meeting a new crew. I, I was watching the show myself, you know, at that time. So it was nice to meet other actors and you know, it was a privilege to be able to be on their show that they were, you know, uh, big enough fans that they would even invite me to be on. I was very honored. That's great. That's great. Yeah, we had Burt Ward on the show here, and uh, he really was enjoying himself. And that was just such a magical time for television, you know? Yeah, there were a lot of good shows. I'm not saying there aren't a lot of good shows now, but in those days, you know, it was just a lot of fun. And I'd go to, you know, premieres and all the different things, the Emmys and Oscars and things. And it was nice to see people that uh, I hadn't worked with, and we'd be in line for, you know, a dinner or something like that, and I'd see all these people that were stars, and, you know, I, it was just fun to be able to be with them. That's so cool. That's so cool. And you did an episode of The Love Boat, and i got to ask you, because you worked on that particular episode, there was Marion Ross, Julie Harris, Peter Graves, Roger Mosley, Connie Stevens. How was that experience? It was just fun. Now, I didn't really know those people, but, you know, I'd see them at different you know, dinners and parades that we do, like, you know, during during the year. So it wasn't that I was good friends with them, but that was kind of a chance to talk to them a little bit and be, you know, say hi when when you're in a parade, you know, you're sitting in a room with everybody waiting for them to call your number so you can go out and get in your car or whatever. So you don't really get a chance to, you know, be there when you're on a set. You're there from maybe 8 to 5 to 9 to 6 if you're a child, and then, then the poor adult actors have to come back after they have a dinner break and, do all their close-ups so that the kids can get out of there. Because if the if the kids are working, when that time limit comes up, that teacher will walk right in the stage, grab your hand, and say, "Come on, <laughs> his time's up," and they march them right off. Wow. Oh man. So when the film Back to the Beach came about, can you tell us uh, how that came about for you? Well, they just called up and said, "Would you? How'd you like to do a movie with so and so?" And I went, "Oh, that sounds good." And they said, "Okay." It's going to film in like a week or two and, you know, come in for a, a wardrobe. And then they sent the script out. I read the script. It was fun. You know, it's fun going to a, a new set and not having a really big part uh, that you have to do a lot of work for and being able to go in there and just have a good time, meet a lot of extra people and nice people, have lunch at the commissary, and then go home and take a paycheck with you. 
That's great. That's great. And, you know, of course, it was Annette Finicello and Frankie Avalon's returning. I, I get, would imagine for one last beach movie, but you also had a, a list, an impressive list of classic TV star cameos. Did you feel like you were among your peers at that point? You know, the, I will be very honest with you. There weren't that many of my peers there the day I did it because a, a, a movie like that sometimes takes, you know, basically weeks to do. So you would just go in and when they – were someplace near to where they thought your part was that that set, um, then they would film yours. So there may not be anybody there except the, the main actors. I mean, the, them, yes, I was very happy to meet them, but a lot of the other celebrities were not there on the same days I was. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And, um, you know, that was also, I think, Pee Wee Herman's first uh, movie debut, right? I, I believe it is, but, I mean, he was not on the set, I don't think, the days I were, was on it. So it was, you know, they were nice people, and they had a great crew, and it was just fun. You go to the studio, you sit around, you meet a lot of nice people, you go have a nice uh, lunch, come back. I had to go to school three hours a day, but, you know, it was just a lot of fun, and uh, I love being an actor, and I still do. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So by 82, uh, Still the Beaver was the TV movie, and that was one of the top ten movies of the week. And um, that led to the se- the new series that you did in 83, the new Leave it to Beaver. Can you tell us about how that came about? Well, you know, I started doing Still the Beaver because, um, you know, I was working um, as a real estate broker, and they came to me and they said, you know, Leave it to Beaver has been all, all these years. How would you like to come back and do a new show? And you could take over the ward, the the father part, and we put in a couple extra kids, and we'll we'll do it for a Ted Turner's network. We did a pilot, and it was so it went over so big, and so many people really liked it that we went on and shot for another six years and quite a few episodes. I think it was over seventy five or a hundred episodes, and it was really fun. We got a lot of the old crew back, and a lot of the people from the show that you know had not minor parts but smaller parts. They all came back, and it was just fun seeing a lot of old friends and working on the set again, and everybody was happy, and it was a, a really good uh, place to be. That's great. That's great. I remember that. I mean, that was a big deal when it came back. We were all excited, me and my friends, that you know it was going to be a new, quote-unquote, a new Leave it to Beaver, which was the name of the show. And you directed multiple episodes on that, correct? Yes, I did. Uh, you know, it was just something I'd always wanted to do, and you know, I knew all the characters very, very well. Tony was also got to direct uh, as many as I did, and it was just fun to be able to go back and, you know, to have, talk to Barbara Billingsley and talk to her how, how she felt about a scene or, you know, some of the other characters that were my friends. So it wasn't like I was just walking in. I, I, I've directed several other things, but when you walk in as a director, if you don't know the actors, you don't know what their range is and things like that. Well, I knew all these people, and I'd say, how would you think you'd say that? And they'd say it, and I'd say, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, you've got that character. Let's go on and, you know, roll them <laughs> with it. That's great. That's great. And what, what sort of things were you able, since you had been behind the camera and then you're in front of the camera, what, what things were you able to, to bring that you had learned in dealing with actors when you were directing? Well, it was, it was very easy because, you know, I'd watched some of the David Butler and Norman Tokar. These are people that did all sorts of movies and uh, Butler worked with Shirley Ma, uh, all these different people that I couldn't even name to you, the number of people, and I'd always watched them work. So I knew when you shot a long shot, then you wanted close-ups over the shoulders. This was an important part of the scene. This was more jibber-jabber that, you know, was just going from one part of the scene to the next, and we didn't need to cover that as much. I knew the sets very well, and I knew the characters all very well. So it was very, very easy for me and a lot of fun. That's great. Yeah, that's great. And what I mean is, is more along the lines of having been an actor, how did that inform your ability as a director to deal with actors? Well, I've been working with the best directors in the world. I mean, the people we had had all been feature directors. They were, you know, David Butler had done uh, uh, all sorts of things with all, all the early child actors and uh, our gang even and people like that. Oh, wow. And I knew, you know, what you need for coverage, people don't realize when you're watching a TV show, you know, you see a long shot and you see close-ups, two shots, all these different things. Well, I knew what you need to cover in a scene, and it's always a big rush, especially when you're working with kids, um, because they can only work uh, so many hours on the set. So you have to have everything very well planned out. But I had been doing that all my life and watching these great directors work. 
you know, David Butler, who was just a, a fabulous. He worked with uh, Shirley Temple and all these other people, and all our directors were like that. They they just didn't hire newbies except for me and Tony, and Tony Dow also got to direct a few. So we went in there, but we had all these teachers behind us that had taught us some wonderful things, so we knew what each scene, what kind of coverage it needed. Right, right, exactly. So moving on from the Leave it to Beaver shows, you know, you went into uh, like the British Panto, and can you explain to our listeners what exactly that is and how you got involved with it? Well, it's we were doing dinner theater, and Pantos are, are, are a, a British comedy, and they're really not that much different. They're, uh, you know, it's just what they call a, a comedy. So Tony Dow called me up and he said he had been invited to do a, uh, a, a one, I think it was, 12 weeks at a dinner theater, and it was a part for two different people, two uh, two males, and would I like to go with them and do it? And I wasn't doing anything at the time. I liked Tony. I said, sure. The next thing we knew, they signed us up for a year, and we did dinner theater all across the United States. Nice. Nice. And I, I read that um, Cinderella was produced by the, the am I pro- pronouncing this correctly, the Lithgow family? Yes. Okay, and who who are the Lithgow family? Because they're still performing today, aren't they? Um, and that's a long time ago. I, I'm I, I wouldn't want to tell you things that weren't true, so I'm not really sure. Honestly, I, I did really have a lot of contact with them. We did like eight weeks here in Los Angeles, and then went on the road. And on the road, um, since it was more expensive to hire uh, another director, Tony and I got to when we'd go into different cities, we would kind of trade off and go in for, a, we'd go in like a week or two early, and we'd have other people that, we had the main cast, but a lot of the other people on that particular play, we'd pick them up in that city so they wouldn't have to travel everybody and get motels and everything. Uh-huh. So it was a lot of fun, and it taught both Tony and I a lot, uh, and we both went on to become directors too, but as, as well as actors. Both right, in film right. And, and what um, what celebrities did you work with doing the panto? Um, not too many celebrities, but, you know, we, we would just pick up actors in every one of the different cities. So we'd have auditions. We'd go there about a week or two before we do auditions. We would, you know, rehearse it with those people and then do it for 8, 10, sometimes as much as 12 or 16 weeks, and then move on to the next one. And we did that for almost a year. And after a year being away from home, we were both kind of tired. We had, we probably could have gone for at least another year and a half or two years, but we were both tired. We went back. And we had done so well on the road that the people in Hollywood said, you know, these guys are that popular doing a show like that would have been pleased to be. We did that for the next six years. So you know, it just all worked out very well. Oh, very nice, very nice. And can you tell us a little bit about your Broadway performances and how those came about? Well, they just called up one day and said, how would you like to do, uh, I think it was Hairspray, and I did that, and all of a sudden let me ask for a few others, and, it was always, always fun, you know, working. I'd done dinner theater, which is basically, I mean, it's not anywhere near Broadway, I know, but when you're doing it, it's the same routine. You'd go in, in fact, and, you know, it was a dinner theater. They'd have a nice dinner, and we went on. Tony and I did the shows. I did them without Tony also. We had a wonderful time. fun, and you had the whole day to yourself because you only came in on weekends. They had one, you know, like a, a luncheon on Sunday. Oh, uh, Jerry, you broke up there at one point. You said they had a luncheon. Uh, yes, well, on, on some of on some of them. Oh, okay, great, great. And so, do you find a different a difference between performing in front of a live audience and performing in front of the camera? Is there a different feeling for both? Uh, yes and no. I mean, in a, when you're doing like a stage play, you're doing the same thing over and over again every night. And you have to kind of really watch yourself because it's easy to lose focus because you start, you know, if you've done something over and over, you think, oh, I've got this down. And so you might see something or see somebody in the audience and you're thinking, and you know, you have to be right on it. Uh, a TV show, if, if it's not a lot of TV show, if it's film like all the Leave it to Beavers were, if you make a mistake, they think that you just do it again. Right, right. And speaking of live TV shows, some of your earliest ones were live shows. Do you re- recall that? And was there a little bit more pressure on those than there would have been on, you know, in front of a camera shoot? Not really, because when you're two is when I started. I started doing pet dog commercials at two when I'd go in and um, Ed Wynn was, had a, a variety show at that time. And he was a really nice man. He talked to me. He said, now, you're going to come on 
and our sponsor is Pet Milk, and I'm going to be saying things, and he had a, what they call in vaudeville a coat of many colors, so it's this really bright coat with a lot of little patches on it. <laughs> and you come up and just start pulling on the coat and saying, it's, it's time for a commercial. He says, I'm going to go, go away, kid, and he showed me. He says, I'm not going to hurt you. I'm going to say, go away. He said, don't listen to me. Just do it. And then I'll say, okay, and then he'd do a commercial. So he was such a nice man, and I went out and did it. Now, once I did it once, it was live TV, so it wasn't something they could just put on film. And I was back on that show every week doing the exact same thing, did it every week, and it's just a lot of fun, and he was a very nice man. That's awesome. I always loved Edwin. I loved seeing his performances. Was He He was Wrong Way Feldman on Gilligan's Island, right? I, I think so. I, I wouldn't swear to that, but if you say so, I'll believe it. Yeah. <laughs> So I wanted to move on here and talk a little bit about your battle with diabetes. Now, um, I have to admit, this is the first time I'm actually mentioning this publicly. Uh, I just found out towards the end of last year that I also have type 2 diabetes, and it's been a bit of a struggle to adjust my eating habits and be aware of things, and particularly, you know, dealing with the numbness in my feet and the neuropathy. You know, how did that come about for you? What, what made you aware that um, something wasn't right? Well, uh, basically, I was working at the time as an actor, but one of the things I did was take some of the money I had, and I invested it in a catering business, and I was doing studio catering, so we were doing all these big movies where I would see two and 300 people for one of the movies is in the desert, so you had to have a <laughs> catering, three or four catering trucks come out, feed these people, and I just, you know, and, and when I was selling my product, which was food, there's writers and they have lunch and I eat. I go to one lunch at one o'clock and another one maybe at two. And so I put on a lot of weight and suddenly a very good friend of mine, um, who was a doctor, said, You know what, Jerry, you're putting on a lot of weight and I said, I'm living the good life. Everybody's a little overweight. He said, But you're very overweight. For my birthday, uh, I got a free exam. And I thought, Oh, I can't pass that up. I'm in wonderful shape. Went in there and he said, You're in real trouble, your A one C is very high, you're, you know, on the way to diabetes, you better hurry up and so I lost a lot of weight and got better. But I realized if I hadn't had that friend as a doctor, I probably wouldn't be here right now. And a lot of my fans were probably just as overweight or maybe even more than I was and I just thought that would be a good thing for me to do to be able to kind of warn them about the consequences of carrying that much weight when you're young or old. Right, right, exactly. And that's a great thing that you're doing for the fans. You know, my, my neuropathy starts, it started as like these random pains all over my body where I felt like somebody was stabbing me with a sharp knife. You know, is, that, is it different for everybody, I think? Yes, it is. Mine was more pain, especially when I got up in the morning. My, my feet would kind of hurt. And I just thought, oh, you know, maybe, my, maybe I slept with socks on that night or, you know, something like that. Or, and uh, I, I have a very good friend that, that's a doctor, and I just happened to mention it, and they said, well, you know what? For your birthday, I'm going to give you a free exam. And when I went in, bam, she said, that's what you got, and the only thing you can do is lose weight and get in a lot better shape, and that's what I did. Yeah, good for you, man, good for you. It's, it's very difficult, too, because I, I just found out actually recently in terms of dealing with it, um, there were times, and this actually – like I said, I just found out myself at the end of last year, and I, I found out there were times in the past couple of years where people would accuse me of being drunk when I didn't have a drop to drink. And I just recently figured out that it was I was uh, hypoglycemic, that my blood sugar was dropping through the floor, and I didn't realize it. And, you know, that that's one of the dangers of, of diabetes, you know? Yeah, you really don't realize how sick you are until they tell you and tell you the consequences of, you know, ignoring it. And so it kind of just kind of, not maybe slowly, but it creeps up on you. And suddenly you go, oh, I'm at the doctor. And they go, this is what your A1C is. This is that. And you go, I beg your pardon? Yeah. <laughs> and they do something quick. And you go, you mean quick? Well, otherwise you won't be here. Right. Right, exactly. So that that's a great thing that you're doing. I'm so glad. And, and you're doing a lot of um, public speaking about this, correct? Right, because like me, I know there's a lot of other people out there that don't realize that you know, yes, you can be a few pounds overweight, but when you start getting to more than a few, um, pretty soon your body, it just can't handle it, and bad things happen to you. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, you said you're, um, well, not that you said, but I, I believe you're in sort of what's called a pre-diabetic stage now, right, because of your diet and exercise? Right. I don't have to, you know, take any insulin to, uh, 
or to take any pills for it. Uh, but I just got lucky because I have a very good friend that's a personal friend, a doctor. She caught it, and I would have never known and probably been a lot worse shape if I hadn't caught it so early. Right, right. Well, that's great. That's great. And uh, you wrote a book uh, in 1998 called And Jerry Mathers as the Beaver, in which you discussed your life, you know, in and out of the show and your friendship with the cast. And in it, you mentioned you had a, you struggled with dyslexia. Is this true? Uh, I did all my life, but it was kind of a, a curse and a blessing because when I was very, very young, even before Leave it to Beaver, um, when you're dyslexic, you don't read things the same way other people do. And so when I would go to school, when I was like in the first grade and, and read, or started to read, I would read out of context and the kids would laugh at me or whatever. It wasn't a big deal, but I would go home and have my mother read to me a book that I knew that was coming up the next day when we had the reading part of the class, and I memorized it. So I got a very good memory of how to study lines, basically. I'd been on live television before that, knew how to do it, but this just really, you know, packed it right in there, so I was really good at it. Oh, okay, that's amazing. So that's basically the the being able to memorize helped you in memorizing scripts. That's incredible. Right, and like Leave it to Beaver, you know, I had a, a whole lot to do in, you know, we would work basically eight to five or nine to six. Well, I was probably working three or four, of maybe five of those hours, you know, reading back lines and different, and because you do close-ups and long shots and, you know, the, 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 the establishing shots. So I'd go over and over again. It all had to be the same. And, you know, it was just really easy for me because I'd already taught myself how to do that. Right, right. That's great. You know, and it's funny because the title of your book and Jerry Mathers as the Beaver, that's such an iconic phrase. And, you know, I even quote that sometimes to this day. And, you know, I think there are people out there who will quote it without even knowing where it came from. And how does that feel to just be so ingrained in our pop culture? You know, it's really nice. I I, I really adore all my fans. It's so nice. Uh, The funny part is when I go to different countries or people come to the United States and they don't speak English, um, Leap to Beaver plays in about 40 languages all over the world. So people will come up to me and start speaking in German or French <laughs> or languages like uh, Chinese or Japanese that I don't even know. And they're kind of surprised because, and I realize that they don't know that I don't speak their language because it's all dubbed. So uh, it's just kind of funny. You meet people and they smile and you, I know they, you know, they have a word for beaver or whatever. Or the Happy Boy. A lot of places don't have beavers, and they wouldn't know what it was. So the show in foreign countries is sometimes called The Happy Boy and His Family. <laughs> That's great. And one thing I neglected to mention at the top of the show was that the reason he's called Beaver is because the character at, at a young age couldn't pronounce his name, which was Theodore. That That's correct, right? Well, that's the reason, because people, after the first year, started saying, well, how did you get the name Beaver? And some people said, well, I do have kind of buck teeth, but they didn't really show that much on the show that, you know, that would be a good reason. So they just somehow came up with that because they had a lot of people say, well, where did that name come from? <laughs> That's great. That's great. Is there a dream role or perhaps a job that you haven't done that you would still like to do someday? I still like working as an actor. Uh, you know, it's nothing that I go out and actively uh, solicit because it's a lot of work. I mean, wh- I found out what Barbara Billingsley and Hugh Beaumont used to have to go through because when you're working with kids, they work from 8 to 5 or 9 to 6, and then they go home, and then you have to go back and reshoot all their scenes and everything like that. So they put in long hours, and we would go home. But, you know, it's fun working. Um, but, uh, you know, I was on Broadway. I, I've done... Uh, uh, a lot of different things. I, I had my own radio show for several years, and so it's it's the kind of thing you know. I've I've done a lot of things I wanted to do, and it's always nice if people ask me. I do do guest spots and things like that, but it's also a lot of work if you have to do it full time. Right, right. And I didn't know that you did a radio show. Can you tell us a little bit about that? What, when and where was that? It was in in Los Angeles. It was a Clear Channel, so it went all over basically the world. It was called. The Jerry Mathers Gathers with Rock and Roll for the Mind, Body, and Soul. Um, I'd have some of my friends from TV come on, that, uh, especially people that were on in different countries because it went all over the world. Um, and it was just a lot of fun. I did it basically on Saturdays and Sundays, um, Saturday evening and, and Sunday evening. So 
it was just a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. I got to play a lot of rock and roll. I had a lot of friends in the music industry, and sometimes I get things that you know they were going to release the next week or you know a couple of weeks from then, and they'd give it to me. And I was I previewed some uh, rock and roll songs that weren't even on the radio yet. That's great. That's great. Did you ever get to meet like uh, like a Casey Kasem or a Wolfman Jack or anything like that? Well, sure, because I would go on and do their shows. A lot of times they're on the telephone, but I'd see them, you know, at uh, basically, you know, parades and all the different things that you do as an actor. And, you know, they'd say, oh, thanks for doing my show. I'd say, you know, that was a pleasure. I had fun. And everybody really liked it. It was, you know, quite a compliment to even be asked to do their shows. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's incredible. We had Bob Eubanks on the show, and he started off as a disc jockey, and he had some great stories about those years. Well, you know, I loved being a disc jockey. I was a disc jockey for about five years. I only worked on Saturdays and Sundays, and it was I was on a clear channel, so I was going all over the world, not only in the United States. So it was fun, and I'd get, you know, people calling me or, or writing to me um, from all over the world saying, I love it, and I love the rock and roll. I got to pick. I was on at night. I was on from... Uh, 12 at night, to, uh, 12, uh, 8 at night till 12 at night. So I was on for four hours and got people from all over the world saying, you're a great disc jockey and play this song and that song. It was just a lot of fun. That's cool. That's cool. What are some of the bands that you, you got to preview before they were released? You know, I can't even remember now. You know how long ago that was? <laughs> <laughs> but there were a lot of good ones. You know, they get all these records and I would just play them. Um, I'd go in a couple hours early and every week there was probably 30 to maybe 40 different songs that had come out that particular week, I'd play them, and the ones I liked, I'd play some of them were big hits, some of them, the only place they ever heard it was probably on my show. <laughs> That's great. That's right. Well, good for you, man. You had a great career, and you're doing some great work with the diabetes and, you know, informing people about that, and uh, so where can the listeners find you online? Can you tell us about your some of your websites? Yeah, sure. Uh, my merchandise site is jerrymathersbeavermerch.com. Um, and my blog is jerrymathers.com, um, and you can get all sorts of things from vintage T-shirts with my authentic signature and a photo of me, beaver hats, knit caps, embroidered autographs uh, on the caps, so hand-signed baseballs, all sorts of different things that, you know, I do autograph shows, and people... You know, say, well, you you never come to this state. Well, there's a whole lot of states, so <laughs> this is the way that people see things on the internet. Like, oh, I got this autographed Beaver baseball. Uh, how can I get one? Well, this is the way you get them. That's great. That's great. Yeah, I was looking at your site earlier. I, I love it. I'm definitely uh, going to grab some stuff, and I highly recommend that the listeners go to jerrymathersbeavermerch.com and, you know, get all that kind of stuff. It's so many great things on there. You know, it was funny. When I saw the autographed baseball, I, all I could think of was, was Beaver accidentally hitting it through the father's car window, you know? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> I hope they don't do that with mine, but if they do, they do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Jerry, for being on the show. Uh, so glad to have you here. And uh, we are going to put all your links on in the uh, in the show notes so people can go and check those out. And um, I thank you very much for inviting me. Yeah, yeah. If you've got anything, you know, coming up that you're gonna, you want to promote, you're more than welcome to come back on the show and talk about it. Love to. Anytime. Awesome. Sounds good. Awesome. Thank you so much, Jerry. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, I hope you enjoyed this amazing interview with Jerry Mathers, a true icon and living legend. So please don't forget to visit jerrymathersmerch.com and check out all the cool stuff that he has there. Remember, you can send your feedback to thenisnow42 at gmail.com. You can also join in the conversation at our Facebook Then Is Now podcast group. Then Is Now podcast is a proud member of the Dorkening Podcast Network, so please be sure to check out the other great shows there at thedorkening.com. You can also visit our website at havenpodcasts.com, where you'll find our sister show, The East Meets the West, in which we discuss Shaw Brothers films and spaghetti western movies. And Then Is Now is on YouTube, so please visit youtube.com slash user slash UncleDeath1 to get the latest videos as well as other fun videos. Please subscribe to our YouTube page and also share the video versions of our podcast with your friends and get them to subscribe as well. Don't forget to go wherever you download your podcast from and leave us a great review so that more listeners can find us. You can find us on all the podcasting apps, especially the big three, iTunes, Spotify, and Stitcher. Class dismissed. The
and this now podcast is intended for entertainment, educational, and informational purposes only. Sounds, music, and clips played during this podcast are the property of their copyright holders. All original content is copyright Jupiter Media. For more shows like the one you just heard, check out the Dorkening Podcast Network at thedorkening.com.